Personal Finance PowerPoint Presentation IRA IRA versus Life Insurance for Retirement Saving Prepare to get financially fit by practicing personal finance Insurance is part of our long-term risk mitigation strategy where we follow the adage of measure twice, cut once, put in a formal process in place, looking something like set the goals, develop a plan to reach them, put the plan in action, review the results, and repeat the process periodically. Most of this information can be found at Investopedia. IRA versus life insurance for retirement savings. What's the difference? which you can find online. Take a look at the references, resources, continue your research from there. This by Daniel Kurt, updated January 19, 2022. In prior presentations, we've been taking a look at insurance in general, moving to life insurance. As we think about life insurance, we wanna think about the two major categories of life insurance being term or pure life insurance versus the permanent life insurance, always comparing and contrasting to to the term or the pure insurance because that could be used as the baseline or ruler keeping the adage in mind of i'm going to buy just the baseline term insurance which is typically cheaper and then invest the difference into some kind of investment savings for things like retirement and possibly getting a tax advantage to do so putting the money into 401k plans or an ira or something like that now we might get more complex insurance strategies which are the permanent insurance which has an investment component to it but we always want to be comparing and contrasting back to that adage why don't i buy the cheaper policy which is the just the life insurance and then invest the difference why am i kind of commingling the insurance along with the the uh, investment and so you have to have some kind of rationale for that that's how i would think about your your planning and your strategy and there could be rationale for it for example you might have more complex tax planning strategies you might for example have maxed out a 401k or ira contribution and therefore it might be more reasonable to to do something like that if you have the money to do something like that or you might have like a state tax planning strategies for example so when saving for retirement a 401k plan is a great place to start especially if your employer matches a portion of your contribution if you are working somewhere and your employer gives you a 401k that's usually a huge benefit and it usually has a pretty high maximum amount that you could put into the 401k they might match the amount in the 401k which is huge and uh, you get a tax benefit for the amount that you put in because you might not be tax added at the point in time that you put it in and the income that is generated dividends interest for example typically not taxed until you pull it out at the point of retirement so if you have some extra money then you might be saying well if i don't have the cash flow which many people don't to maximize out my 401k plan and the choice is do i want to buy a more expensive insurance policy that has an investment component to it or do I wanna buy the term policy, which is typically cheaper, so I have the insurance and then invest in my 401k plan, it might be a good thing to invest basically in the 401k plan because of the number of benefits in terms of tax savings you get with relation to it. It's also a little bit more com less complex given the fact that you're buying just insurance and then your 401k plan is clearly just for retirement. But where do you go once you've contributed the maximum amount for the match or if your place of employment doesn't offer a qualified plan a retirement plan in other words you might have a 401k plan but there's some limit in terms of how much you can put into the 401k plan and get that benefit in terms of the tax benefit or you might not have access to a 401k plan in which case it might be advantageous to try to buy more complex uh, insurance in that case to get some kind of tax benefits on the life insurance side of things as opposed to simply purchasing the term insurance but this is probably the case for more complex tax strategies most likely for more uh, wealthy individuals many workers continue to fund their workplace plan but there are other options including using a life insurance policy in certain cases the insurance as investment approach can be a wise move but usually for wealthier investors so now we're thinking about the insurance not so much as just life insurance but also as an investment tool so however investors who have maxed out their allow their allowable 401k and individual retirement accounts that's the ira contributions so then if if you don't have the 401k plan or sometimes you could still put money into an ira if you do have a 401k plan but there's a much lower maximum on the ira in terms of how much you can put in and still get a benefit in terms of of lowering uh, your taxable income in essence for the point in time that you put the money in although you might still get a benefit 
uh, in terms of the growth of uh, a, a retirement plan like a 401k and an IRA, even if you don't get that initial uh, deduction, if you're still allowed to put money in, but uh, should evaluate whether uh, the sizable fees of life insurance policies would outweigh any potential tax benefits. So you could put money into the life insurance uh, as kind of an investment tool strategy, but usually it's gonna cost more to do that because the life insurance is a more complex tool. So if you're doing it just for the tax benefit, it might be more beneficial if you have access to these other tools, the 401k plans, uh, then the life insurance, if you've maxed out these other tools, then you might consider you know, using the life insurance more like an investment. So an IRA. So an IRA uh, can, can grow in a tax advantage way for disbursement later in life. That's kind of a point in an IRA. You get a benefit when you put the money into an IRA and then it can grow without being taxed on it until you take the money out. Allows tax deferred growth in investments which are then subject to income tax upon withdrawal and which come with penalties for early withdrawal. So in other words, you've got the money under kind of like the umbrella of an IRA. So it's still invested in just normal stuff, whatever you would invest in if you were saving for investments or retirement without an IRA, stocks, bonds, savings accounts. But it's under like an umbrella, you can think of it, meaning that if you took the money out for no reason, uh, then you would have to pay generally a penalty on it. That restriction is the price that you pay in order to get the tax benefits. So withdrawal uh, in retirement after reaching age 59 and a half or taxed at your income tax rate. So when you take the money out uh, at, after 59 and a half, you're typically gonna be taxed on it, meaning all the, all the growth and the money that you put in there was basically deferred for, for tax purposes and then taxed when you take it out. There are annual limits on how much you can contribute. So there's gonna be a limit in terms of how much you could put into the IRA and that's where you get this point where you might max it out if you've got substantial cash flow, which you possibly only have if you're fairly well off, you would think. Then on the life insurance side of things, can build to and accumulate retirement savings and disperse funds tax-free if designed correctly. So in other words, you're trying to use the life insurance as basically another kind of a savings tool as opposed as opposed to just purely life insurance. And possibly if you're able to design things in such a way that you can get uh, the tax-free distributions, that would clearly be a benefit. So it may benefit the wealthy. So this would typically be more of a complex financial strategy that might be more useful if you have the cash flow uh, in order to do it possibly in situations where you've maxed out other tax benefit options like an IRA or a 401k plan can make a periodic withdrawal as long as you don't pull out more than what you paid in premiums and you won't experience a tax hit. So that's one of the benefits with the life insurance is that if you've got the money and that kind of tax component of it, you might be able to access access it in the case of an emergency a little bit more easily without being penalized than if it's under the umbrella of an IRA. Even if you can't pull it out directly, you might be able to take a loan against it, which is kind of similar to pulling it out. Might be subject to interest if you were to do something like that. Surrendering your policy, uh, your policy decreases the, the death benefit for heirs and you may lose coverage altogether. So IRA or 401k. Uh, between these two strategies, the IRA is a more straightforward way to save for retirement. So when you're thinking about saving for retirement, if you have access to a 401k, that's usually the way to go. These two tools are similar in nature, but uh, the 401k usually has a, a larger amount that you can put in to it, and it might have a matching component, which often makes it more beneficial than an IRA. So you create an account with a broker firm, mutual fund company, or bank and select the investments you'd like to make with your contributions. So both of these tools, you can think of them as just kind of an umbrella. The, the actual investment tools underneath that umbrella are just like anything else. You would, If you had money, where would you put it? Well, stocks, bonds, uh, IRAs, you know, ETFs, whatnot. So those are the same tools. They're just under the umbrella of these IRAs, which basically means they're restricted uh, in the event that you pull them out, and, but you get a tax benefit for doing that and incentive by the government to try to get you to save for retirement. So these can include everything from individual stocks to mutual funds and gold bullion. So features, um, features and tax treatment. The main perk of these accounts is their tax treatment, which is similar to 401ks. 
So with a traditional IRA, your qualified contributions are tax deductible and the investment grows on a tax deferred basis. So when you put the money in, you get a tax benefit because you basically get to lower your taxable income or you can think of it like a deduction. And so that's gonna give you a tax benefit at that point. And the growth uh, is something that you're not paying tax on the dividends and interest until you pull the money out. Withdrawals and retirement after reaching age 59 and a half are taxed at your income tax rate. So a Roth IRA is similar, but the tax treatment and benefits are different. So a Roth IRA is kind of like a reverse traditional IRA. So it's a little bit, it's like a backwards IRA, meaning you get you don't get the tax benefit up front, but when you pull the money out, then you, you don't have to pay taxes on it and the growth on the money then is where is where you get the benefit uh, on the on the Roth IRA. So you invest using after tax dollars, meaning there's no tax deduction in the year of contribution. However, you don't pay a dime in additional taxes on the accrued funds. So which is great. So you pull the money out. That means dividends and interest and whatnot have gone up and you're not paying the taxes when you pull it out, even on the gains, not simply just the principal, which is what you would typically think of. Uh, in, in a normal investment. So as long as you've owned the account for at least five years and have reached age 59 and a half before making a withdrawal. So contribution limits, there are annual limits to how much money uh, can be de uh, deposited into an IRA. For the 2021 and 2022 tax year, the annual contribution limit for traditional and Roth IRAs is $6,000. And if you're age 50 and over, uh, you can contribute another 1,000 called a catch-up contribution. For non-Roth 401k plans, the maximum contribution for the 2021 tax year is $19,500. So you can see that the 401k plan is substantial so if you have the 401k plan, you know, it's less likely that most people are going to max out the 401k plan unless you got a significant right amount of cash flow. That's why it's that's why more advanced strategies above and beyond maxing out the 401k plan are more likely to apply to more wealthy individuals. And for 2022, it's 20,500 plus a 6,500 catch up contribution for each year is allowed for those 50 or older. So after retiring, you'll pay ordinary income tax on whatever amount you withdraw. Permanent life insurance. Another possible route is to buy permanent life insurance. In addition to offering a death benefit for your survivors, these policies also feature a saving component. Part of your premium goes towards your death benefit. Another portion builds up your cash value account, which grows on a tax deferred basis. So now you've got the insurance and you've got that kind of investment component, which is the cash component, which has that same kind of tax deferred uh, investment strategy. Uh, in a similar com in a similar fashion to like the the uh, the the retirement instruments, for example, on the growth component. So for life insurance, whole life insurance, permanent life insurance policies are a little complicated. This is one of the downsides, of course, you're getting into a more complex strategy instead of just separating these things out as you would do if there wasn't some weird tax thing that possibly could make it advantageous to do to do a more complex uh, convoluted strategy. So each time you pay a premium, part of it goes towards a cash value account. With a whole life insurance policy, the carrier credits your, your uh, account by a certain percentage based on how its own investments perform. So if you've had your policy for a few years, you'll uh, typically see annual returns in the 3% to 6% range often earned in tax-free investment. Variable life insurance, other types of permanent life insurance work a little different. For example, with a variable universal life insurance, that's the VUL policy, the amount of the credit is tied to the performance of stock and bonds funds of your choosing. We talked about these in, in a bit more depth in prior presentations. If you want to take a look at them in more depth, the potential returns are higher, but so is the risk. If the market loses ground over a given period, you may have to pay a higher premium to keep your coverage in place. Paid up additions. Investors who rely on life insurance for retirement needs should think long term. Uh, it can take 10 to 20 years to build up a sizable cash value account. So these are types of strategies that might be, you know, long term kind of strategies that that will, you know, start to pay off over a longer window or range of time. Once your balance is big enough, there are a few ways uh, you can draw on your policy for personal needs. Paid up additions, PUA, are a good way of increasing the amount of cash value in a policy for low 
relative cost, which can maximize retirement income. Periodic withdrawals. Another possibility is to make periodic withdrawals. As long as you don't pull out more than your basis, that is how much you paid in premiums, you won't experience a tax hit for doing so. So any additional amount is subject to ordinary income tax rates. To keep the Internal Revenue Service IRS at bay, some folks stop making withdrawals once they reach their basis. From there, they take out a loan against their policy, which is usually tax free. Surrendering your policy. Yet another option is to resent, uh, surrender your policy and get the cash value in one lump sum minus any outstanding loans. But there's an important catch. Anytime you take money out, uh, you're decreasing the death benefit for your heirs. So there's going to be a relationship between the cash value and the death benefit, the amount that your heirs would get in, in the event of death. If you take a loan against your policy, you have to pay it back with interest to build it back up again. So if you take the loan, you can use the cash value as collateral, uh, but and, and that's not going to be generally counted as incomes, according to the IRS, because you didn't really pull the money out. And uh, but you might have to pay interest on it because it's structured, of course, as a loan at that time. So and if you surrender it, you'll probably lose your coverage altogether. Compare this to someone who buys uh, a much cheaper term life insurance policy, which has no saving feature and invests the difference in an IRA. So that's always what you wanna basically be comparing against. You're gonna say, okay, I could buy just term life insurance, which is just, I'm just buying life insurance and I can invest the difference and in, say an IRA or a, a 401k plan or I can try to get into kind of some more complex strategies with more complex insurance tools, which are basically getting into an investment and life insurance component. Again, possibly those becoming more beneficial at the point where you're, where you're not getting as much benefit putting the money into say an IRA or a 401k plan, possibly because you're hitting the max, possibly because you have a, a, or you're fairly well off. You've got a good cash, like a lot of cash flow. So uh, they can dip into their savings at any time after age 59 and a half without affecting the insurance or its payout if you die. Uh, and they can leave any remaining balance to their family members, which, ca which can't be said for your cash value account. A costly approach. Perhaps the biggest knock on permanent life insurance policies is their upfront cost. First, there's the initial fee that helps pay the agent's commission. So obviously setting up this kind of more complex type of tool that has these different components to it is going to be a bit more costly than setting up just an IRA, which is just like an investment that's under this umbrella of a retirement thing. So often this can eat up half of your first year premiums. Consequently, uh, it takes a few years for your cash value account to start growing. So it's definitely possibly more of a long-term strategy. On top of that, policyholders tend to face steep investment fees, often around 3% per year. So again, if you just invest in like an, like an index funds, for example, then you would think that uh, the cost of the expense of the investing in it, the pain for the, for the maintenance of the investment will not be as high, you would think, as a more complexly set up uh, insurance kind of uh, plan. So by contrast, the average expense ratio in 2020 for uh, open end mutual funds and ETS offered for sale was 0.41%. So significant difference to the 3%. So investing in an IRA allows you to eliminate this significant drag on your returns. But that's not all. You also have to worry about surrender charges if your policy lapses within the first few years. You'll lose not only your death benefit, but also a considerable portion of your cash balance as well. With most policies, the amount of this fee gradually decreases over a period of years and then disappears. However, if you are committed to long-term strategies, permanent life insurance policies designed to accumulate extra cash value will tend to break even around the 10th year of the policy. So more long-term strategy possibly for people with with significant cash flows. Moreover, cash is accumulated every year before that. So if you did surrender the policy, you would receive some money back and not be out of the entire amount of premiums you have paid. So when insurance as an investment makes sense, when does it make sense to do this more complex strategy and not just buy the simple term insurance and invest the difference? 
Does it ever make sense then to use life insurance as an investment? The answer is absolutely in some limited cases. So for example, wealthier individuals will sometimes set up what's known as an irre irrevocable life insurance trust so their heirs can avoid estate taxes. So now we're getting in to the estate tax planning, which again is typically for more wealthy individuals that are gonna be taxed when they die. You die and the, the, the wealthy individual died. The IRS goes over and rolls the corpse over and strips them naked and makes sure there's, does a cavity search for, for diamonds or something. So in any case, so in order to avoid that, technically the trust is paying for premiums for the life insurance policy. So the death benefit isn't considered part of the, of the deceased family member's estate. So uh, beyond that, life insurance is sometimes a reasonable choice for ev everyday investors who have maxed out their allowable 401k and IRA contributions. That's still a significantly high category, especially for a 401k. You gotta have significant cash flow to kind of be able to do that. But if you have that cash flow, then it becomes possibly more advantageous at that point. So, but even then, it's worth evaluating whether the sizable fees outweigh the potential tax benefits. So then again, you got more complexity, you've got sizable fees related to it. Uh, so is that, is that worthwhile given the fact that you might get some tax benefit? It's not a straightforward a tax benefit. In other words, it's putting money under the umbrella of a 401k or an IRA. Agent, uh, agents make a lot of money selling the idea that life insurance is a great way to save for retirement. So clearly if you're talking to an agent, they they're going to make a commission so they're they're going to be invested in the idea that this is a good tool and possibly sell it to people that are, are not in that kind of niche area where it would be more advantageous because they don't have the cash flow to max out their ira or 401k plan for example but given the considerable cost of the of these policies you're probably better off purchasing low cost term policy investing in something simpler like an ira Investopedia uh, does not provide tax investment or financial services and advice. So this isn't this isn't advice as we're just talking here. Uh, the information is presented without consideration of the investment objective, risk tolerance or financial circumstances of any specific investor and might not be suitable for all investors. So disclaimer, disclaimer here, investing involves risk, including the possibility of loss of principal. Investors should consider engaging a financial professional to determine a suitable retirement savings and, and investing strategy. And when you do that, you typically wanna be talking to someone who's not making commission based on the things that they're gonna invest you in, at least in part. So a CPA, a financial planner that's not tied to, the, to an insurance company, for example, a lawyer or something like that, possibly paying them just for advice so that you then uh, can depend on their advice being independent and then talk to the brokers and whatnot and the insurance companies.